Hi everybody. Um, sometimes apparently my microphone gives me like a chipmunk voice, uh, in which case I'd have to restart my computer. Uh, I've tried to set it up so that that won't happen, but please uh, mention in the chat if my voice is all weird. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm really excited to be doing this project. Um, thanks to Firebird for letting me do this. Uh, it's a very it's a very weird project, so I hope that. Uh, if you're here, you are here with an open mind. Um, I guess I just wanted to establish like right out the gate that, you know, in some of the like ads we've been posting for this workshop, I've tried to emphasize that like I'm genuinely figuring this out as I go along. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, I'm nervous about that. I thought uh, it might be a good idea to um, like finish making the e-reader before I show up doing this um, because I, I have several of them. So I'm trying to like iteratively figure out how to make them. Um, but I also really want to demystify the process of doing things like this. Um, oh, I forgot to record, oh no. Um, I want to demystify the process of doing things like this. <clears throat> and I guess I wanted to start by saying that, you know, often when I introduce myself in a workshop or um, on a live stream, I'll describe myself as a glass blower. And I'll say, oh, I'm Charlie, I'm a glass blower, that's what I do for a living. Um, but I think what that really means is that I'm just a person who uh, learned how to blow glass by trying it a bunch. And I've been working in glass blowing for years. Um, I really love doing it, uh, and I get better and better at it all the time. But uh, I frequently feel when I'm blowing glass like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and there are times that I'm uh, not being confident enough, uh, that I'm kind of bringing insecurities into the hot shop. But there are other times um, that are maybe more frequent than you might think, where I'm blowing glass in a professional setting and I really don't know what's going to happen because I'm trying something new. I have to do that all the time. I have to learn new techniques. I have to... Um, for example, work with glass uh, that has a recipe that I've never used before, or work with a color that I've never used before. And I think the process of getting good at doing something that's technical and difficult, at least for me, involves much more uh, just sort of uh, blind leaps. Uh, it involves a lot of like really just um, shrugging experimentation than I think many people realize. And in my, in my life and in my line of work as an interdisciplinary artist, I'm continually having to learn how to do things that I really don't know how to do. And so this is another one of those things. I've worked with electronics a little bit. My soldering um, is passable. It's not great. I think if people out there are good at soldering, they're probably going to criticize my soldering in the comments, which I 100% deserve. Um, but I think I wanted to present this as an amateur to try and show you that even if you don't know how to work with electronics, even if you don't know how to solder, even if you have no idea how electronic objects like e-readers work, you can learn how to do this stuff. And that's the point of videos like this. And there are tons of videos all over YouTube on how to learn how to solder, how to learn uh, to work with electronics. Um, so my hope uh, in all of this is to, is to on, in some level, like open the door and demystify the kinds of electronic objects that we use all the time. These objects that are like black boxes. We, we don't know how they work. I don't know how they work. I think um, many of the people who worked on certain aspects of these objects, let's say like a UX designer for Apple, probably doesn't know how the electronics in the iPhone work. And uh, I think, you know, at a moment when um, serious conversations about replacing many of the systems in our society that are oppressive uh, are coming to the surface and are becoming more normal, I would like to normalize and talk seriously about what it's going to mean to replace some of the technologies and some of the, um, some of the just physical uh, systems that we rely on all the time with our own anti-capitalist, um, non-oppressive systems. And so one of the things that I really value um, is the open software and open hardware movement. 
and that's the basis of this video. It's how I found Joey Castillo. It's um, it's uh, it, it sort of allows uh, this workshop to be possible, and it allows the creation of this object to be possible. So, what am I talking about? Um, Joey Castillo is he's a hacker um, who posted. I, I actually I should even back up. I apologize. Um, I'm, when I say the word hacker, I mean people think of like a criminal who breaks into um, software systems. But in the like sort of maker or um, digital programming community, a hacker is a person who is teaching themselves how to code, basically. A person who like works outside of institutions in order to learn how to manipulate software um, and then maybe manipulate hardware um, to uh, make it do what they want it to do. Um, so Joey Castillo designed this board. This is the, um, it's called Oddly Specific Objects is like the name of his like quote unquote company, but um, he's, he can't possibly be making very much money off of these. Um, this was $15. I had to buy all of the parts to populate the board independently. It literally comes screen printed on the back with instructions as to how to actually assemble the e-reader. And it's all labeled. There are all these little, uh, these little surface mount uh, connections that we're gonna have to mount all of our components to. I would be very surprised if I'm able to actually finish or even like make significant headway on this e-reader during this workshop. So over the course of the next few weeks, I'll be building it. As I get better at it, I'm gonna release more polished tutorials as to like how do you, for example, make sure that the SD card reader is attached properly and working? How do you ensure that the screen is working? That kind of thing. Um, but this project is, as far as I can tell, the only functioning open hardware e-reader anywhere in the world. Um, and what that means is that the schematics for this object, uh, the, the explanations as to how it works, they're all publicly available and they're free. Um, that's why uh, this object can be purchased for so cheap. Um, it was made cheaply. I'm sure it was made in China. Um, but uh, uh, the point for me is that this object was deliberately released for the sake of having a kind of um, a level of accessibility that just is not possible with proprietary hardware and proprietary software. Um, I'm not 100% sure on what the state of the law is now, but um, you know, for a long time in the United States, we didn't even have the right to repair our iPhones ourselves. It would void the warranty if you replaced a part yourself outside of Apple, which on some level to me signals that even though this is my phone and I use it every day, I need it for work, um, it's an essential part of my life, I don't really own it because if something goes wrong with it, um, I'm giving up my rights to my relationship with Apple. Uh, I'm giving up my rights to their expertise if I replace the components on this object. So on some level, they're like heavily incentivized to keep me reliant on Apple um, in order to keep this device running. And anybody who's used an Apple device for a long time uh, has gone through this where, uh, I don't know, Apple will phase out, uh, let's say, the eighth inch audio jack from their, head, from their uh, phone. And then all of a sudden, you need to buy a dongle from Apple to plug into the bottom of your phone so that you can use your, uh, let's say, studio quality headphones um, with your phone. Uh, so now you owe Apple more money in order to make their device compatible with your life. Um, Anyway, this is just like normal stuff. They're a company, they're trying to extract money, like whatever, they're doing their thing. But this object and projects like it prove to me that it is genuinely possible to make something that's useful, to make something that works and can fit into your life without being driven solely by the profit motive. If Joey Castillo wanted to make a bunch of money off of these, he wouldn't be making them this way. They're deliberately designed so that people like me and people like you can figure out how they work, learn how to operate on them, learn how to um, learn how to build them, learn how to fix them, learn how to maintain them, and then have an e-reader that we literally own uh, as individuals and as a community because we can spread information about how they work.
Um, and I guess before I get started, I'm going to do a little soldering demo here. Um, I also just wanted to talk about the fact that, um, you know, I'm hesitant to get explicit about politics in these videos because I know lots of different people watch them from uh, all over the political spectrum and uh, from lots of different places. And I, I do want to respect that. I care about that. But I also want to be honest about what I think is important um, and why I'm making these videos and why I'm talking about the topics that I'm talking about. So I have found personally that in the hacker and maker communities, uh, they're often dominated by men. They're often dominated by white men, um, at least in the English speaking communities that I've come across. Um, and uh, people tend to be libertarian in those communities. I think, uh, I think because, uh, and this, what I'm about to say is just my opinion, uh, but I think it's because a lot of the people who are working on these kinds of projects um, just care about the technology itself. Like STEM people, like sort of nerdy uh, tinkerers and hackers, I think tend to just be interested in what, what the possibilities are uh, with open hardware and open source software. You know, the people who are using Linux operating systems, uh, like I run this channel on, uh, tend to be uh, very nerdy, very, um, and just genuinely interested in tinkering with, with software. And so the reason I think this is exciting um, as a leftist is that it proves that collaborative volunteer run projects um, work better than profit driven projects depending on what your priorities are and there's a reason that mac os x android um kind of name your uh name your like big blockbuster uh software or hardware project there's a reason that those projects are often built on open source software uh mac os x uh is uh, derived from Unix, which was a um, one of the like original massively open and free software projects. It sort of sp uh, like splintered into Mac OS X and the various versions of Linux. Like if I if I understand uh, the research I did correctly, um, what that means for me is that uh, the idea that the profit motive, that the competitive impulse is the only thing that causes innovation, um, to me is proven wrong by the fact that many of the expensive, very useful, commercial grade products that are uh, technological in nature, that we use all the time, that our society literally relies on, um, are built on open source projects. They depend on code and hardware and effort from volunteers that were collaborating and experimenting and were genuinely interested in sharing information and um, sharing their labor with each other to make new possibilities emerge. Um, so to me, that's really exciting. And I want to introduce these ideas um, to people in Chicago and to people in my life that might find electronics to be intimidating and might find software to be intimidating. Um, people who maybe wouldn't seek this stuff out on their own. Um, I want to show you that it can be complicated, but you can learn how to do this stuff. And we're going to learn how to do it together. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to give a quick demo on uh, how soldering actually works. How do we solder? Uh, uh, and, you know, what am I talking about when I do that? Uh, so this is definitely something you're going to need um, if you're doing this project or a project like it. You don't need a fancy soldering iron. Um, I'm using a, uh, a Weller, it's a WES51. It's an adjustable temperature soldering iron because I solder a number of things um, around my life. Uh, I also actually use it to make stained glass sometimes. But um, you, can, you can use just like a cheap Radio Shack, like plug-in soldering iron for this kind of stuff. Uh, an expensive soldering iron is just gonna give you more control over what you're doing um, and it's going to um, be more flexible because different materials require uh, that you solder at different temperatures. So I'm going to fire up our second camera here. Um, let's get it going. And then I'll show you how I solder. Okay, so 
uh, and this will just go to show you how how improvised, how unprofessional the studio really is. And I've been able to um, modify microphones with this setup. I've been able to build audio cables with this setup. Um, I've uh, I've done a lot of like uh, at this point I've done um, a good bit of like Arduino tweaking, um, just like little electronic projects here and there. Um, and this is the setup I use. This is literally a two by four with clothespins <laughs> nailed to it. Here it is. Uh, and actually, the reason I like this is um, because if I'm working, if I'm working with anything um, that has potentially like an electric current running through it, I like to use wood. It's insulating. I'm less nervous about it. Um, a soldering iron can definitely uh, light stuff on fire, uh, and wood will catch on fire. But um, you can see here with my soldering tip, I can run it along this block of wood, and it's not even smoking. So the tip, I think, is uh, it's set to uh, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you can see there isn't even a burn on the wood. So if you're concerned about like burning down your home with a soldering iron or something, like obviously be careful. I would avoid using fabric. Um, like I wouldn't have like a tablecloth on your work desk or anything, but um, it's perfectly fine to use wood. And clothespins are cheap and widely available. So here, I'm gonna lower this. And then let's get our workspace into focus here. So I'm just going to solder two wires together to show you how it works. Um, I've heard people pronounce it solder because that's how it's uh, spelled, but I think it's pronounced solder, but S-O-L-D-E-R. And what we're doing is we're connecting two pieces of metal together so that we can run electricity through them. That's basically all we're doing. So this here. is just two wires. You can see they're disconnected. Uh, they're made of copper, I believe, with, um, they have like a little rubber shield. This is just like standard electrical, um, just standard like hobbyist wire. Okay, and here, here I'm gonna move this into the shot so you can see it. So this is my soldering iron. Um, like I said, I have it set to about 450 degrees. Um, the tip is really hot. The metal part is also hot, so you know, be careful. Um, I have this little sponge. I uh, get it wet with water. I think you can hear that. Yeah. So this little holder is just so you don't uh, burn yourself with it. If you are gonna go cheap on with a soldering iron, which I fully support. I think like do whatever you got to do to um, make your project happen. I do think it's a really good idea to have some kind of a holder so you're not ever um, putting the solder soldering iron down on a table um, because you, you can totally start a fire that way. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, having the little holder is, it's easy, it works. I've had this iron, I think for five years, something like that, and it continues to work great. So I do like, Weller seems to be a good brand. Um, so, for what it's worth, that's what I'm using. Okay, so I am using rosin core solder. Um, this, as far as I know, let's just make sure so I'm not lying to you. Um, okay, so this has lead in it. I want you to see my face. This has lead in it. Uh, lead is really bad for you. It's like super dangerous. Um, some of the some of the like really cool glass mixtures that you might see in um, old glass color had lead in them. A lot of crystal glass has lead in it, and many of those processes are no longer used 
even in an industrial capacity because lead is dangerous. Lead fumes are bad for you. Um, lead paint chips, uh, lead in Chicago's uh, water pipes getting into the water. That stuff is all really bad for you. Um, it's toxic. I think it's a neurotoxin. Um, so you want to be super, super careful. Uh, you definitely don't want to like deliberately inhale the fumes from soldering. Um, I think this is safe to handle, but just so you know, uh, just be careful when you're working with it. Definitely look it up um, before you use it. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of precautions to, to keep in mind. I just try to wash my hands after I use it. I try to not touch my face. I try to not like breathe in the fumes from soldering because what you're doing is you are going to get the solder hot. You're going to flow the solder between your two wires, connecting them together. And the idea is that it creates a metal bridge between the two pieces that hopefully is clean uh, and like, oh, I'm trying to think of a way to describe this. It's kind of like smoothly shaped enough that electricity can run across it without any trouble. Because you basically want your connection to act as if uh, it's a continuation of the wire. Um, if, your, if your solder joint is really like pointy or like oddly shaped or like frosted, or like it doesn't connect well, uh, then basically the electricity is going to encounter resistance when it's trying to go through your connection. And so you're going to maybe lose signal, you could cause a short, um, so your electronics won't work properly if your soldering isn't, um, isn't good. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch here. I'll show you how to do a clean solder joint. All right, so we have our clothespins close together. And by the way, if you don't want to make like a goofy wooden wire holder, there are definitely products that you can just buy that work better than this goofy thing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tin my soldering iron. And so I'm touching the solder to the tip of my iron. And in a moment, it's going to start to melt. It takes a little bit to heat up. And there it goes. So I have a little bead of solder on there. What we don't want to do when we're adding solder is actually touch the solder to the solder iron, because then the solder is going to flow to the iron, not to our joint. So what we're actually doing is we're going to tin each part of the wire. So I'm holding my iron to the copper wire, which is going to heat it up. And then I'm going to feed my solder into that connection. And hopefully the heat transfers through the metal. To the point where we get a little bead and it melts. So we'll see what happens here. Oh, I know what happened. I forgot something. Okay, so here's what we're doing. This is why we're working this out. Okay, so I have something else, which is called flux. Um, so you can solder the way that I was just showing you. Often I have to use a higher heat than I need to if I'm like quickly soldering something together and I don't have flux. Like I said, it works, it's fine, but Flux is going to allow the joint to flow better. It's going to sort of make it clear to the solder where it needs to go. Um, and it seems to make everything go a little smoother. So we're going to use this flux pen that I got at the recommendation of Joey Castillo. But um, you can also get flux just in a little like jar. It comes with a brush. Um, and that's just going to make all of this go a little smoother. So, uh, But I forgot because I'm often, I'm often working on electronics in a kind of like hurried frenzy. Um, so I'm just trying to make it work. Um, and I uh, don't always have solder around, or don't always have flux around. So um, you can solder without it. Uh, it just doesn't work as well. Okay, so 
here's my little here's my little pen. Um, today was my first time using it, so you can see here I dumped out a little flux. So I'm going to apply that flux to both wires. And please keep in mind while you're doing this, while you're learning to solder, while you're working with electronics, the iron is hot. Also, the wires get hot. Everything is hot. That's how this works. So please be careful when you're touching any part of the thing that is made of metal. OK, so I've got my. Piece is ready to go here. I've got my flux on. Okay, and there we go. So now the connection is warm, so I'm applying flux to the connection, or applying solder to the connection. And I'm literally just going in with my soldering iron to clean that up. But it worked. So now we have a connection between the two wires. So I'm literally going in, try and smooth that out, try and clean it up a little bit. There we go. It always takes just a little bit longer than I want it to. But it does happen. OK. So now the wires are uh, soldered together. So if I did a good job of it, which I think I did an OK job, um, what's going to happen is this wire, which is now hot, is going to act as a continuous wire, a continuous connection. So this is the principle behind everything that we're going to have to do in order to assemble our e-reader. So I'm going to put this away here. And let's start talking about the e-reader chip itself. What are we working with? How does this work? Um, and where are we going to start? So, this is our board. Um, it's a PCB, which means that it's like a prefabricated plastic board with connections on top. And I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm going to hold it up close. Um, basically, there are little connections between the parts. I'm going to try and get some reflected light for you so you can see. Do you guys see that? It's like a little little subway system of um, like reflective wires. Basically, underneath this board, um, those shiny surface like conductive um, parts are connected inside the board to all the places they need to go. So this circuit is already interconnected. It just needs different components added on top of it in order for the thing to work. So. What are our main components? Well, unfortunately for us, there are a ton of them. Um, I'm, I've published a link to um, this project uh, on like Joey Castillo's like uh, his listed page. So he basically published the project with all the software, all the technical information you need, a link to buy the board on Tindy, which is like a second like electronics, um, like a DIY electronics shop that has released his board. Um, so the main things to go over are the board itself, this, which is the Adafruit Feather Wing. This is the brain of the project. So um, I bought this from Adafruit itself. Um, here it is up close. This is its own little DIY object. So it is made for projects just like this. Uh, the Feather, uh, yeah, the Feather M4 Express. So basically, it can run on um, 
I think this is micro USB power. Um, you can also directly wire power to it. You can hook it up to a battery. Um, this is going to be doing most of the heavy lifting in our e-reader. Um, and I say that because there's another e-reader project that's more complicated uh, by, it's an oddly specific objects project. It's the same, it's the same thing basically, but it skips the Feather M4 Express brain um, and literally builds the, uh, like the processing parts of the, um, of the e-reader like directly onto the board. This project skips all that. It's much simpler. Um, so all we need to do is buy the prefabricated processor from Adafruit. Um, and uh, just for the, for the record, many of the components I'm going to be talking about in this video, many of the components I had to buy um, are fabricated in China. They are just like massively available, super common um, electronics components uh, that like, frankly, w I have no idea whether they were made under safe labor conditions. If I had to guess, I would say they were not. I think most electronics are made under conditions in China and uh, just elsewhere outside the United States um, that we as American or that I as an American worker would find abhorrent. Um, I would probably be horrified to see um, what people have to do in order to make these components. But uh, I think it is a massive improvement for a company like Adafruit to be focusing on <clears throat> open hardware and open source projects uh, that have to be manufactured in some way, as opposed to locked down proprietary electronics projects that are being manufactured under the same conditions, uh, just with no transparency and without sharing any information about uh, not just their labor practices, but um, how the objects actually work. So by my estimation, even though I feel kind of bad, buying some of these components, um, I think it's better to know about these things, to dig into them, to get our hands dirty, and to understand what we're actually dealing with when we use an e-reader or when we use an iPhone or when we use a computer, um, than just to sort of turn a blind eye to things that are happening on a massive scale, whether or not we like it. Um, I think understanding these things are better than not understanding them. So with that said, uh, I, I, I guess I just wanted to make it clear that like, I don't know if I can give Adafruit a full-throated endorsement. Um, I don't know that I can uh, fully get behind their manufacturing practices, uh, but I definitely appreciate the way that they seem to deliberately focus on open source, open hardware projects for the sake of people being able to experiment, people being able to understand new technologies, and um, people being able to build things themselves. Uh, so uh, that's just my little lecture on that. Okay, so that's the Feather M4 Express. The other key component, um, which is actually surprisingly hard to come by, um, is our e-paper screen. I love that it just says, okay. I assume that they test these in the factory and uh, then when they work, they're like, okay. So our e-paper screen, um, I wanna talk about this. Uh, I first became interested in this project because I use like weird old word processing typewriters uh, to write because uh, I'm like addicted to the internet. I think the internet is totally fascinating. And if you put a computer in front of me, I'll spend you know a couple hours doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and then really quickly I'll just find myself browsing the internet, reading Wikipedia, uh, browsing social media, whatever it is. Um, and so I I love typing on um, objects that allow me to type because I can type faster than I can write, uh, but that have a kind of digital brain that can remember what I write um, because I don't like lugging like a typewriter around or something. And typewriters can't actually work as fast as I want them to because I need to get my thoughts down quickly when I'm writing. So um, I came across a project, uh, I forget what it's called, and I actually don't want to endorse it because the thing is so expensive, it's unbelievable. But uh, basically there's a project, it's like an e-paper laptop that, is, that operates as a typewriter. It can't do anything other than like you type, it saves stuff, and I think you can upload stuff to Google Drive. Um, and I was like, oh, I would love to build something like that myself. And I came to discover that e-paper technology is in many ways still uh, kind of new and it's sort of locked down in a way that other technologies don't seem to be. 
I don't entirely understand why, uh, but it seems like e-paper displays are different than LCD displays in the sense that they can't update themselves like physically, they can't like refresh the screen with new information nearly as quickly. And they seem to be uh, pretty expensive depending on how big they are. So this company, Good Display, which is a Chinese um, electronics manufacturer, Here's their logo, good display. I was linked to them by uh, the ebook Featherwing website. Um, and the, pro the, the, the actual objects are, are pretty cheap. Shipping was really expensive, but um, uh, these weren't too bad. Um, these screens themselves weren't too bad. Uh, but they're really small. And I think the reason is that bigger, like six inch by four inch screens or whatever, they're hard to find reliably and they're really expensive. And the like software hardware interactions between your processor and your e-paper display seem to be really complicated. That's the impression I get browsing lots of different projects. Um, I bring up all of this to say that I have looked for a really long time for an easily updatable sort of typewriter style e-paper object. And there seem to be very few um, working uh, prototypes of objects that can actually do that. There's some really expensive products that you can buy. There's a Kickstarter product, uh, the name I can't remember, that does that. But um, I started to wonder, like, oh, are there, are there open source e-readers? Because I don't want to give Jeff Bezos my money, and I don't want to give uh, Barnes & Noble my money. You know, I hate sort of, like, contributing to the decline of local bookstores. I love bookstores like Myopic here in Chicago. Um, so, but I, you know, I read a lot of PDFs. I read a lot of stuff um, that is digital and that like you can't find as a book. Um, I also tend to lug a bunch of books around with me all the time, and it's really nice to just have a little e-reader device instead of having books. So, you know, I was like, oh, I'll try to find an open source uh, ebook project, and it is extraordinarily difficult to find anyone who has figured out how to actually do this. Apparently, it's really technically complicated. Apparently, it takes a ton of labor, a lot of problem solving, um, and it seems like the e-paper relationship uh, with, with the processor, like actually getting information onto the e-paper display, getting it to update um, properly, getting it to actually show what you want it to show for whatever reason, seems to be really complicated. It seems like a genuine barrier for a lot of projects. That's the impression I get, anyway. I didn't develop this project, I just kind of found it. Um, okay, so, uh, like I was saying, this is our e-paper display. This is also going to be our most difficult connection because it has this little, like, ribbon connector guy. So this, here, I'll hold it up to the other camera. This is a fragile connection. It's fragile just physically, but it's also fragile temperature-wise. It would be really easy to just tear through that ribbon connector with your soldering iron. So I want you guys to be really, really careful when you're um, putting the display on. And that's why I'm doing this for you. This is why I'm doing this first, and it's also why I have multiple copies of the e-reader. It's because I recognize uh, I might mess this up. It might be really easy to mess this up. So uh, if I fry a component, if I like trash something, render it unusable, you guys will know, hey, be careful doing this part. If you're an amateur, you might mess it up for X, X Y, and Z reason. All right, so next up on our component list, uh, we just have, uh, I'm, oh, here, I'll pull it out. If I can find it. Oh, here it is. Um, we just have a big list that came with my online order of all our electronic components. And there are a ton of them. They came in a box. There's lots of little switches, lots of little resistors, um, diodes, etc. And those are just all the little circuit components that just make the thing work. So here is the list of components. Now, I'm showing you this not to intimidate you but to show you that I didn't have to figure any of this out. On the website for the open book Feather Wing, there's literally just a, uh, I think it's called a BOM file, a B-O-M file. Um, and what that is, is it's, it's almost like a .csv file or like an Excel spreadsheet. 
um, that contains all of the ordering information, the number of components you're going to need, it contains the prices, um, it contains all the, um, the information that the manufacturers need. So it's basically just like a list of components with their codes, tells you what they do, and then, um, yeah, and you have like the manufacturer part number and the DigiKey part number. So I bought all of these parts on a website called digikey.com. I had to make an account, but it was free. Um, and then I just uploaded the bomb file to DigiKey. They automatically fulfilled my order and they sent it out during the coronavirus lockdown. Uh, it came, it showed up within two weeks. Um, so what I have to do now and what you're gonna have to do as you assemble the e-reader is go through, figure out what everything is and figure out where it goes. So everything corresponds to a spot on our chip. So for example, or on our board rather. I have a deep fear of being criticized by nerds who know what they're talking about. Um, I'm overcoming that fear to do this workshop with you. So for example, I, I just went through, tried to figure out like literally what, what like a colloquial name for all these parts would be. Like what is gonna make sense for me uh, as a person who has no idea what any of these things do or how they work. Um, so for example, here, I wrote display connection because these are the little receivers for the ribbon connector on our e-paper display. This is our SD card reader. So you can see right here, it says micro SD reader. So I think we're gonna start there. All right, so it looks like it comes in a little vacuum sealed plastic container. Got my scissors. So I'm gonna cut it out. Put it back in the bag so I don't lose track of it. And then put it back in the box it was shipped from. Even though that box is way too small for my roommate's cat, she still continually tries to sleep in it. The box is this big. Uh, so if you have a cat, maybe keep the box closed so that the cat can't uh, try and snuggle up in there because then you're gonna get cat hair all over your precious electronic components. Before you even figure out what they do, or you know, how to take care of them or whatever. All right, so we're peeling this back. And here it is, that's super cool. So I'll show you that up close. That's the bottom, it's made of plastic. You can see the little copper connections right here where the, S the micro SD card is gonna slide in. And there is the metal protected side. So that, as far as I can tell, whoops, I done, is gonna go, let me get in focus here. It's gonna go right here. So this is our micro SD card connector. And it says here, uh, it says here on the board, you definitely can't see this on the camera, but it says here, micro SD slot, a micro SD card interfaces with the Feather main board via the SPI interface, MISO, MOSI, SCK, SDCS. Uh, so those are, uh, it's kind of like, I'm gonna use the wrong technical language because I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm gonna say that so many times uh, during this video. Um, basically, MISO and MOSI are like serial, uh, they're like streams of data connections. One of them is out and one of them is in. And so any, uh, any like processor like the M4, any like Arduino chip, basically any, any board that is doing some kind of like calculation or processing 
uh, needs to be able to send the results of its calculations out and receive information in. So the, from what I understand, at its most basic level, that's called a serial connection. And that basically just means that it's sending bits back and forth uh, to and from uh, some other electronic component. So for example, if you had a chip that was powering a speaker, you would need the chip to send somehow, send some kind of on signal to make the speaker push forward, and then an off signal to turn the magnet off and allow the speaker to go back. And that's how you create your sound waves. So you have your board processing digital waves, and then somehow sending a signal that goes on, off, on, off, on, off. You amplify the signal enough that it can physically move the speaker, and then all of a sudden, you turn an abstract calculation into physical motion and then sound. We're not making sound with this board, but I think I just understand sound science better than I understand uh, making an e-paper display work. Uh, but basically, because this thing needs to be able to read an SD card uh, and then send information from that SD card to our processor, our Feather uh, M4 Express, then we're going to use the uh, we're going to use the M MISO and MOSI. Uh, connections, so our serial communications connections. Okay. So let's see here. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking to align, looking to align our board with our with our serial port. Now, uh, I think it's useful often when you're doing a project like this to kind of zoom out and think about, well, in common sense terms, where would this, how would this thing be oriented? And to me, probably they would mount it so that you can slide your SD card in and out from the side. So I suspect this is where the opening goes. But let's make sure that our connections actually line up. So I've Flipped the chip over, and you can see. Here, I'm going to use this guy to point stuff out. And you can see we have a tab here, and a tab here, and then we have a row of little connections, little copper looking connections. And right here, we have the same kinds of connections. We have one here, we have one here, and then we have a row. Okay, that's great news. So that means spatially they line up. OK, so. I'm like super nervous to do this next part. I have, uh, I've just never done soldering like this before. Um, but we're going to try it. So what we're going to do, uh, this is called, I think it's called surface mount soldering. And basically, it differs from the kind of soldering that I showed you before, um, in the fact that in the fact that it uh, I have I can't get on both sides of the joint. Basically, I can't get my soldering iron on the underside of the PCB uh, in order to to heat like the other side of that connection. Um, and when I'm working around my uh, when I'm, when I'm working around my connection, like when I was soldering the two wires together, what I'll often do is try to heat the wire on like multiple sides. Um, my technique isn't perfect. I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but as somebody who's heated glass that you continually kind of spin in the flame, it makes intuitive sense to me that you're gonna get better uh, conducted heat if you kind of heat it all the way around and then I'll sort of stay in one spot where I'm holding my connection in place physically with the soldering iron, and then you have your solder flow. So you can't do that here, right? Uh, and if you look at the way the chip actually, uh, I keep calling it a chip, but I think that's improper. Uh, if you look at the way that the board has our e-reader attached to it, so it's just sitting on there right now, notice the SD card reader actually covers the connections. So, how are we going to attach it? What we're going to do is we're going to tin our connections before we add our e-reader. 
or I'm sorry, we're going to tin our connections before we add our SD card reader. Then I'm going to place the SD card reader on top of those connections, and then we're going to melt them in to attach it. Does that make sense? So we're basically priming the connections before we actually attach anything. All right, so I'm going to get my soldering iron ready. And we're just going to break the seal. We're going to touch our board. We're going to be super courageous about it. to tin my solder or tin my iron just by heating up my uh, solder here and then I'm gonna heat this connection or heat this little little guy here trouble getting it going. So I think maybe my soldering tip has a little too much residue on it. So let's find out. Let's see what we can do here. Yeah, so I'm having trouble making that connection. So what I'm going to do, uh, because we've only got about 10 minutes left, what I'm going to do is show you how to mock up the A4 feather, and then I'm going to work on my soldering tip. I think I'm, what I'm going to do, I, I'm not set up to do this on the video yet, but I'm going to take a, some sandpaper, and I'm actually going to like clean off this tip. Also Google the best thing to do, but intuitively I'd like to kind of scratch off some of the metal here, so let me show you what I think the problem is. I don't normally use this soldering iron for electronics work that is so sensitive, right? And you can see the edge, the tip of my iron is just a little bit gunked up. So let's see if it's gonna help to remove that gunk and then see if I can transfer the heat a little bit better. That might kind of explain some of the trouble I've been having. Um, in the meantime, Let's talk about breadboards. So breadboards are a prototyping tool. This is a breadboard, I'll pull it up to the camera. Um, you can buy them at like Micro Center, kind of wherever. Um, you could get like hobbyist electronics. And basically the way they work is you have rows of like pre-made electronic connections. So these rows go up and down. You can see they're numbered. They're connected across the gap, I believe. Um, or no, they're actually not. Uh, so these rows are numbered. And then these, the positive and negative rows, run all the way uh, up and down horizontally across the board. So what that means for us when we're using our Feather M4 is that we can test the components that aren't surface mount uh, by plugging our little breadboard wire connectors, which came with this breadboard, but you can also just buy separately. Um, these are like patch cables. We can connect them to the necessary parts of our e-reader and then we can connect the e-reader to the breadboard and then connect the breadboard to the Feather M4 Express. So why would we want to do this? Uh, basically, we can test to make sure that all of our components are working. Um, if you are prototyping a project that's similar to this, but uh, not this project exactly, um, 
you can just make sure that it's working before you commit to like actually soldering the components together. Uh, you can also like, for example, I don't actually know where I'm gonna want the Feather M4 Express to live on my physical object. I know where it needs to be connected electronically because the instructions tell me where to put it, but I don't actually know where physically I want it to like sit. I don't know exactly how it's gonna relate to the other objects around it. It might kind of need to like hang off the side. Um, I think I'm gonna have to probably build some kind of a case for this object. So I just wanna make sure that everything's in the right place. Before I figure that out, I need to have the thing up and running. I need to be able to have it in my hand, I need to see, oh, I've got room here, I don't have room there, right? So it's all, it's made just much easier um, when we have uh, a breadboard and we can just prototype it. So the way I've done this in the past, you can solder these connections if you'd like. Um, I also like to just bend my, um, I also like to just bend my wires so that they slip. Ooh, one second. Okay. All right, we're back. Um, I also like to just bend my wires like this so I can kind of get a loose connection, get them settled in, hook them underneath the board, and then we have our connection. And you can see up close here, the connection we need to make is we need, we need those copper rings around our board to make contact with our wire. That's the actual connection we're making, right? So if we were to solder the connection, it would like really clearly connect to that outer ring. Signal could go in and out. Um, but here, because we're just making a temporary connection, I just need to make sure that it makes contact with that ring and only that ring. So for now, just temporarily, I'm gonna lay, I'm gonna uh, put it through the hole, lay the board on top of it, So what's nice about having the breadboard is you're just free to make all kinds of mistakes without like totally committing to them. When I do drawing videos, I love to tell people to commit to their mistakes. But I think when you're making electronics, it's just so easy to like totally mess stuff up and not know why it's not working. At least it is for me because I'm an amateur and I don't entirely know what I'm doing. Um, that that like it's good to be able to recover from a mistake, right? It's good to have not totally ru ruined your object um, and to still have a chance of it working. Okay, so what are these connections? Um, the, uh, I'm sure you can't read it, but the ebook feather wing instructions explain that uh, there's a three volt pin to power something like a GPS. Uh, I assume that's like a three volt out. So that is this connection right here. Um, that is beyond the scope of our project. I don't really need to power any external device. Basically, because you can run power to the Feather M4, through the Feather M4, and then through your, uh, basically, you have your M4 powered. The M4 can transfer power to the oddly specific objects. Uh, the e-paper e display, uh, the other components, the SD card reader, they're getting power from the, uh, the M4 Feather Express's power source. You can also send extra power out to any component you're adding to this project. So um, 
Joey uses the example of like, let's say you wanted to have a GPS system built into your little objects. So you could somehow connect to Google Maps or something. Uh, uh, maybe that's like beyond the scope of this project, but you know what I mean? Like if you wanted to somehow uh, get coordinates, um, you could totally do that, but I'm not trying to modify this. I don't need this thing to do anything other than uh, what it's specifically designed to do. So we only need our three main, uh, it's, it's called the, uh, the TX Ground RX Trio. Um, so, yeah, cool. So all we're going to do is to connect those to the breadboard, and then we're going to connect the breadboard to our Feather M4. So I wish these were easier to read, but they're really not. Um, so on our Feather Express, this seems so intimidating, I know, if you haven't seen these before. But all we're looking for is RX, TX, and there it is. And then we also have uh, ground. All that means, for our purposes, is RX and TX are our communication, uh, like back and forth, like serial communication. And then our ground is literally an unconnected metal, uh, like just like freestanding metal um, connector that allows us to like send excess electricity somewhere so that we don't have like extra, uh, extra electricity running through the board, shorting out any of the projects, giving us any trouble. All right, so I'm just gonna continue the way I was working before. Got my wires. Um, I need a few more of these, so I have a little bundle of these prototyping wires. I try to use wires of different colors next to each other so I can just keep track of what's where. So you can see here, I connect the wire down the row. And then that's a continuous connection. So that's how your breadboard works. And then I'm going to take my chip here. And this TX. So I'm going to connect TX to RX because we need to invert them and Rx to Tx. And again, none of this is knowledge I had beforehand. It literally just tells me what to do on the board. And then we connect the ground to ground. And although it's ugly, now when we run power to our M4 Feather Express, it's going to be able to connect with and power the rest of our board. So that's prototyped. Here we go. This is our. This is the beginning of our little setup. Um, I'm going to continue to play with my soldering iron. I'm going to continue to do research, and we'll be uh, doing these videos for quite a while. And uh, I'm sure it'll get better as they go along. Please feel free to uh, hit me up with any questions about the project. I'm going to continue to post links to it um, if this interests you even if it feels beyond sort of the scope of uh, what you really like want to put effort into, this is a really awesome project. I'm so excited to be a part of it. And if you can contribute uh, to Joey Castillo's, um, if you can contribute to his work, uh, please do. He's accepting donations. He works really hard. Um, and I think this is great. So thank you so much for tuning in. There'll be, there's more Raccoon Laboratory to come. Uh, and yeah, I hope you all have a great day.